In 2022, Mojave Audio released the MA37, their faithful recreation of an iconic microphone with some cool history behind it. Let's dive in. In the late 1950s, a new microphone from Sony called the C37A hit the Los Angeles music scene and forever changed music recording. Adopted by Capitol Records, Sunset Sound, RCA, Gold Star, and used on countless records like the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds all the way to modern productions, producers and engineers loved its silky smooth top end and neutral yet warm and musical sound. Compared to the popular mics of the time, mostly the Neumann U47 and AKG C12, it was also a lot smaller and easier to position. But maybe even more miraculous than the sound and size of Sony's first large diaphragm condenser was that it even came into existence at all. At the end of World War II, Japanese radio and music recording companies had difficulty accessing high quality microphones. The NHK, basically the Japanese equivalent of NPR or the BBC, began prototyping a U47 clone that could be produced in Japan. But they ran into several production issues and passed on following through with the design. So, around 1953, Sony engineer Kanane Nakatsuru picked it up. He and his team of engineers had a long list of issues they needed to resolve. Most pressing was the capsule. When NHK was experimenting with the microphone, they tried copying Neumann's capsule design using a celluloid diaphragm with silver plating on one side. This, however, was prone to emitting noise and sometimes even bursting into flames. Ultimately, Nakatsuru decided to design his own capsule from the ground up. For the diaphragm, he chose a polyester material DuPont had invented called Mylar. However, he had difficulty attaching the pull plate to the Mylar material. It was Sony founder Masaru Ibuka who led him to the idea of applying a thin layer of gold to the Mylar via a technique called gold sputtering. Once the diaphragm was working, they set about designing a capsule that was very unique at the time. RCA's engineers had designed a microphone called the 77D, which allowed the user to adjust the polar pattern via a mechanical shutter over the ribbon element. They decided to adopt this functionality to a condenser microphone by placing a small disc behind the diaphragm which was attached to a screw. The user could turn the screw clockwise to press the disc against the rear of the diaphragm and create an omnidirectional pattern. Turning it in the opposite direction pulls the disc away and creates a cardioid pattern. Now that their capsule was designed, they had to figure out which tubes to use. Because the cost of importing popular tubes like the Telefunken AC701 or VF14 made them completely out of the question, they decided to search for a tube that could be found at local radio stores. Eventually, they decided on the 6AU6. The 6AU6 was invented in the US and had been licensed by several Japanese companies after the war. In the time since, the Japanese had become pretty good at producing them domestically. The only issue the engineers now faced was getting the 6AU6 with all the other components to fit inside of the microphone they envisioned. The NHK was concerned that if the microphone were too large, even as large as a U47, it would upstage performers on screen. They wanted something that could be hidden from view or at least be on the smaller side. This created a problem because in order to make it the size that the NHK wanted, you could really only fit a capsule, tube, and maybe a couple of resistors and capacitors. The U47 and most other tube microphones used a transformer to reach an appropriate impedance, but the type of transformer required for this would have been three quarters the size of the mic they ended up with. So ultimately it was necessary to run the tube as a cathode follower, meaning the transformer was moved to the power supply box. This solved the impedance issue, and as a bonus, it resulted in extremely high headroom. So, with that figured out, Sony's first large diaphragm condenser was complete. In 1955, Sony released the C37A microphone to the public. It was imported into the US by a company called Superscope shortly after, and the rest is history. So, let's get back to Mojave. David Royer, being the microphone technology super nerd that he is, was long fascinated by the story of the C37A. 
so he always envisioned reviving it, with some technical innovations of his own, of course. So he took some time between the endless assembly of MA-1000s to do just that. Calling on over 30 years of experience building tube microphones that used cathode followers, a famous example being the Royer 122V, the circuitry he designed has been modernized and simplified. Many of the components in the original microphone were chosen to meet antiquated telephone and broadcast standards or parts constraints of the time. David's design uses an EF86 tube. As you'll remember, the original 6AU6 was chosen for its availability at the time. It wasn't a particularly high-grade component. The EF86 produces less noise and is more consistent and reliable. He sourced a capsule to almost identical specifications as the C37A, but each one is built by hand in California. All of these improvements give the MA37 a more consistent quality and lower noise than the original, but delivers the same unique sonic characteristics that made the C37A a holy grail of studio microphones. If you want to learn more about the Mojave MA37 and hear audio samples, visit mojaveaudio.com.